All right. Well, as Dave said, my name's Kathy Bilinowski. I'm a horticulture instructor um, with MU Extension in the Urban West region. So that's Platte, Clay, and Jackson counties. And as Dave said, I assist, my, my job uh, is to assist uh, Dr. Rial with the Extension Master Gardener program. So I get to help with all their fun projects and uh, meet a lot of great EMGs in our region, in our chapter. And then the other part of my job is um, working, managing two downtown Kansas City, Missouri food pantry gardens. So I'm lucky in that I have, I have kind of an office job or an administrative kind of job. <laughs> and then I also get to be outside and with volunteers and planting things. So it's, it's a great experience. So what I'd like to do for the next 40, 45 minutes is talk about unusual vegetables that will grow here in our state in um, I think almost any part of our state of Missouri. Uh, and as I say in the subtitle here, little known vegetables for Missouri gardens. Um, so a lot of these are gonna be new to us. Um, and I know Dr. Trinkline has written about unusual vegetables too. So there might be a little bit of overlap, but hopefully some of these vegetables will be new to you. So I decided to choose to emphasize or focus on warm season vegetable crops from around the world. And these are crops that, as I mentioned, can be successfully grown in the Kansas City region and I'm sure in other parts of Missouri. Um, I wanted to, I decided to emphasize crops that will do well in our hot, humid, long, and sometimes dry summers. So challenging conditions. And um, due to climate change, we're probably gonna see more and more of those challenging conditions. Uh, and as, as I said, many of these uh, vegetable crops are new to us, but that just means that we haven't seen them in our uh, horticulture, you know, trade yet in our part of the world, uh, but they could very well be uh, popular and used in other parts of the world. And another reason to think about incorporating these, some of these unusual crops in our own vegetable gardens is that um, they're easily, a lot of them are very easily grown crops that are nutritious, and, and can kind of expand our repertoire of crops and get us through, get us, get us a harvest, even through those challenging, hot, humid, and sometimes dry times in our state. Uh, these crops can expand our vegetable gardening and culinary horizons. Um, and we don't need to travel. I have a friend uh, from uh, a church group I belong to who traveled to Thailand to take a cooking class. Well, whether we find the seeds for these crops or pick them up at a ethnic grocery store or go to a restaurant where they serve them in a dish, um, you know, we can, we can learn about these cuisines and uh, culinary traditions and, and growing traditions from around the globe from our own backyard, from our own vegetable gardens, or from our own communities. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna share some recipes. And um, just like Debbie said, <laughs> excuse me, if you have any uh, questions, and I'll repeat this at the end, but I know it's sometimes hard to, to write down the links or I, I would be happy to share uh, links. You can email me and get copy to the links to the resources and recipes. So I was lucky to have parents who got me outside and in the garden, kind of like Donna's doing with her children uh, from an early age. I remember being outside and camping and gardening. 
Um, and then, although my undergraduate degree is in English literature, um, it just seemed like I was drawn to working outdoors. And um, I've worked for various urban gardening and urban ag nonprofits in the Kansas City region. So I've, I've been doing this for, you know, several decades at least. And it, but then when I went and worked for, uh, it was a joint project between Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas and uh, a nonprofit called Cultivate Kansas City. I worked for four years as a farm manager uh, with uh, resettled refugee farmers uh, like these women here. And my jaw would drop. It's like, what is that? There, I was exposed to vegetables and they taught me, you know, how they used them, how to grow them that I had never seen before. So it was quite an adventure. And I was grateful for being able to learn from them. Um, so, you know, like I said, I'm going to focus on warm season crops. So um, these are crops that need a long growing season and they're tender crops, just like any of our tender crops. So they're going to be, you're going to want to uh, start them inside in a greenhouse uh, or a sunny window uh, and then set them out after the danger of frost is passed. Um, and then in the fall, if you want to extend the season, these are crops that are going to need to be protected either with floating row cover or maybe a, a, a low tunnel to keep them from getting frosted. They need full sun. They like warm soil, just like tomatoes or peppers would. Um, some of our uh, winter squash prefer the warm soil. Uh, and then they need a steady access to water. So let's just jump in and look at some of these vegetables. Now, this is a familiar one to us. I'm sure we've seen this in the grocery store, at farmer's markets. This black beauty variety of eggplant has been around uh, since about the early 1900s in the United States. It was introduced to the horticulture trade. But eggplants have probably been eaten and used and grown in the United States since the early 1800s. Um, uh, probably introduced from uh, Spanish uh, colonists and other European colonists or immigrants. Um, this uh, link down here, and again, I can share this with you if you have an interest. It's, a, it's actually a master gardener journal from uh, Arizona. And it, it's a wonderful description, kind of the, the history of eggplants. So humans have been eating eggplants for a long time. Now, this was one I had never seen before that the immigrants at the Juniper Gardens training uh, farm were growing. To me, I thought this looks like a horse nettle. I would never want to eat this, but they insisted I try it. And um, it was the creamiest, smoothest, mildest eggplant I had ever eaten. This, this particular one is sold by Johnny's Selected Seed and other seed companies. And its uh, name is Kermit because it's green like a frog. Um, these are also sometimes called Thai eggplants. They need full sun, just like any other eggplant. You might wanna use a floating row cover to protect new transplants until they get established. This, has a, this eggplant has a very bushy habit. So it's actually kind of an attractive plant. Um, harvest the little eggplants that are about, when they're green and mature and ready to be harvested, they're about the size of a ping pong ball. Um, and, and like I said, they're very mild and they have a very good flavor. Here's another eggplant that some of the uh, resettled refugee farmers were growing. It's called an African or an Ethiopian eggplant. And I realized that I had actually seen this before. It's sold in some craft stores um, and I think at farmer's markets dried as kind of a, a 
dried miniature pumpkin, but it's actually an eggplant. And in other cultures, um, it is used for its kind of uh, bitter, spicy uh, flavor it adds to dishes. There are also varieties of this African eggplant that are very sweet. So, and I might mention too, a lot of the um, immigrant farmers that I was working with at Juniper Gardens Training Farm were uh, representatives of different ethnic groups from Burma or uh, Myanmar. So, um, I learned that, you know, just like we like sweet, savory, uh, are probably our two popular, most common flavors that we like in our cooking or cuisine, they love bitter. And um, so, you know, I thought, well, it's maybe not as popular, but, you know, there are people who like beer that can be described as kind of bitter red wine, that could be described as kind of bitter. Or uh, I thought too, blue cheese, very unusual flavor that's, that's popular. So, you know, it, it's probably an acquired taste, but it's something you might see out there at some farmer's markets where immigrants are, are selling to their own community. And as you probably know, are all kinds of eggplants. Um, these striped ones, the long uh, Asian ones that can be dark purple or light purple or even white. Uh, I've seen white eggplant. And then these are the true egg eggplants where uh, they are really are about the size of an egg and shaped like an egg. Here's another new uh, vegetable crop that I was introduced to uh, at the, with the immigrant farmers. If they called it Chin Bon. I found out it's called Roselle. They grew it for the slightly fleshy tart leaves. Um, and this, again, it's a very tender plant. It's, it's hardy once it's established, but it doesn't like to be cold or, or exposed to frost. So you need to start it indoors from seed about six to eight weeks before uh, frost free date and then transplant outdoors in May, just like you would tomatoes or peppers. It's got a very bushy, attractive habit. It's, it's a relative of hibiscus. It's in the hibiscus family. So it's bushy. It's got these red stems, um, these interesting leaves. Uh, so it's a very attractive plant. And I learned that they prepare the leaves. They're kind of like a very sour spinach. So they just stir fry them or stew them, put them in soups, and they cook down kind of like spinach. Um, and I found as I was doing research on this roselle, and again, you can see it's called chin bon uh, to the uh, different ethnic groups from Burma. Um, it's it's very popular. It's, it's something that as soon as these uh, people were resettled here in the Kansas City area, they kept asking the people at Catholic Charities, where can I get Chin Bon, uh, or in English, Roselle seeds. So we had to do a little research, but we found sources. And then as I did a little bit more research, you know, it was one of those kind of jaw-dropping experiences. It's like, this isn't necessarily a new or unusual crop at all. It, it, it's another name for it is the Florida cranberry. And a little research um, showed me that it had actually been a crop in uh, Florida where it's very warm. The calyx of the flower are very uh, fleshy and red as you see. So it's used to make a red sour beverage that can be sweetened with sugar. It's also used to make a jam or flavor, flavorful spreads or paste that are add to rice and other dishes. <coughs> the calyx, this fleshy red part uh, that develops as the flower is blooming and after the flower blooms can be dried and used later for uh, tea. 
So if you've ever had red zinger tea, an herbal tea, you've already experienced at least one part of the roselle plant or the chinban plant that uh, we can use. So it's this little YouTube video up here is um, a video I found just recently about the roselle plant. Um, and it, it kind of describes uh, how to use it and some of the attractive features of the plant. And it was put out by uh, Rare Seeds. So that's the uh, name of that Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company that uh, sells a lot of unusual seeds. So it also has very attractive flowers. They're reminiscent of uh, hibiscus, the ornamental hibiscus or okra or cotton uh, flowers. In some parts of the world, um, the stems are used to make cord because the, the stem fibers are, are very tough and long lasting. It's also in some parts of the world considered a traditional medicinal plant. So now let's talk about some uh, unusual vining crops. Um, some will be familiar, but there's maybe some new ways that we can use them, and some might be new to you. So sweet potato. How many of us have grown giant sweet potatoes? If you leave them in the ground to the very, very end of the season, uh, you might get sweet potatoes the size of this, uh, this one, like a football. But did you know that the leaves are edible? They're very nutritious and um, are used around the world uh, as a kind of like, like we would Swiss chard or spinach, uh, maybe uh, mustard greens or kale or collards. So it's kind of used as an edible green. Uh, they can be stir fried. Uh, you can add your own spices or flavorings. Um, and again, they're one of those foods or, you know, greens that you can cook quickly by stir frying, and that helps reduce the nutrient loss. It's used in a lot of Filipino or Chinese stir fry. Uh, and here's a, a website that will tell you all about sweet potatoes, uh, not only how to use the tubers and the nutritional value of the tubers, but also the uh, edible qualities and nutritional value of the leaves. Here's another sweet potato. It's, its common name is water spinach, but it's actually a type of sweet potato. It doesn't produce a tuber. It needs moist soil. And I saw the farmers out at the training farm, they would dig like a shallow uh, planting area, maybe four to five inches uh, deeper then the surrounding soil, and then they would get, they would go to the grocery stores that uh, serve their ethnic communities and um, buy uh, stems and root them and then plant them again out in, in the garden. So the leaves are edible. They're very uh, succulent and fleshy. They're very easy and, and cook very quickly. And they're also very nutritious. Now, if you ever move to Florida or coastal Texas, you might want to check because in some parts of the uh, United States where it's warm year round, this is classified as an invasive plant, but it could be safely planted here um, because our cold temperatures will kill it off in the uh, fall and winter. Here was another uh, vining crop, this Burmese pumpkin. It's a winter squash, um, but it just, <coughs> what makes it unusual is that it has an extremely smooth uh, texture and very pleasant, sweet taste. It needs a long growing season. And again, you can direct sow after the danger of frost like any other uh, winter squash, um, or you could start it a little bit early inside uh, before, beforehand and get a head start. 
it likes to sprawl on the ground so it needs lots of room and it's got these attractive speckles and spots so it's a very um, attractive for maybe a table ornament before you decide to prepare it other vining crops need some kind of trellis or support system um, here's just some examples. I'm sure as gardeners, you've experimented with all kinds of trellis, maybe even including your a neighbor's or your own chain link fence. Um, we can use bamboo stakes uh, and string to make trellises for vining crops. Um, this is a really neat kind of uh, arch or arbor uh, trellis at a local community garden in Independence, Missouri. Um, it's kind of a combination of using scraps of two by fours. I think the, the material that kind of covers the arch is chain link fence. And then there's some uh, parallel poles to add stability. Um, so it creates shade, but it also supports some uh, vining crops. Another vining crop. Um, that needs a trellis, but is very easy to grow are these Italian edible gourds. Uh, Kansas City, up in the Northeast part of Kansas City, Missouri, there is an old Italian neighborhood. And if you drive around, um, you'll see giant fig trees in, in backyards that people have kept going for years and years. Uh, and I have met and talked to some gardeners who have a very elaborate arbor, kind of like a, a grape arbor, but they were growing these um, edible gourds and they would hang down underneath in the shade. Um, so they do need a very strong tre trellis. Uh, the vines will form a canopy and they benefit from adequate, adequate water and a side dressing of compost. Um, it's about 60 to 80 days to harvest and they're best kind of like zucchini. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to let our zucchinis get huge or summer squash get huge, but uh, they have the most tender skin and they're easiest to prepare and, and use in cooking when they're about six to 10 inches long. Um, and, and that way they still have very tender skins and uh, really lend themselves to any dish that you would cook with regular uh, summer squash. Vining okra, um, it's also called ridge gourd or edible loofah. Uh, it is a very assertive, or maybe you would even call it uh, aggressive vine crop. So it definitely needs a strong trellis. Um, you wanna pick the the young fruit when it's about the size, again, that six to 10 inches long is when it's still, the skin is tender. And you use, you would use it like okra or summer squash. Uh, it needs full sun, but then, you know, the, the uh, vining okra fruit kind of hangs underneath in the shade of the trellis. Um, and these, these can be eaten. They have a very, uh, unusual, uh, pleasant kind of nutty flavor. But if you look, if you get too many of them and uh, you let them mature and dry, they can be used in like any other loofah as a cleaning sponge. So here's one again, um, maybe like that Ethiopian, Ethiopian eggplant. It's kind of an acquired taste. Bitter melon is truly bitter, um, but it is used in a lot of Asian cuisines, uh, Central Asian cuisines. So in uh, Laos, Vietnam, um, different parts of India, uh, and it is a very popular vegetable. So it's almost attractive enough that um, you could grow it as a just an ornamental uh, curiosity in the garden. Uh, if you do try to eat it, um, you need to take the seeds out. The seeds aren't good to eat. 
Now, if you do have some, they quickly, you know, once they get to this mature size, they do quickly ripen. They'll even like split open and you'll see these red seeds. Now the, the flesh around the red seeds, that reddish part can be eaten. But again, the seeds themselves should not be eaten. So a lot of the way, ways that these are prepared is that the seeds are scooped out and they're stuffed. Um, and uh, again, it's maybe an acquired taste, but it's such a tough, productive vine, it might be worth trying in our own gardens. Um, long beans. These are a type of cowpea. Uh, the, sometimes they're called yard long beans. Um, and there are red varieties. Uh, maybe you've seen it's called red noodle bean. Uh, they're also just plain green ones. They've got a different flavor than our traditional green beans or bush beans, a little bit richer or meatier flavor. Uh, so you eat the immature pods like a snap bean. Um, they do require a trellis or support or a fence to grow on. Uh, they love the hot, humid summers of Missouri. And then if you do have some pods that get over mature, you can just uh, let them go on and ripen and they can be shelled as you, and used just like you would any other cow pea, like a Crowder pea or black eyed peas. Here's one I tried a couple years ago, um, jelly melon, or I think it's also called a horned melon. It turns a bright deep orange when it's ready to harvest. And then uh, when you slice it open, there, there's this beautiful kind of chartreuse yellow green center and the fruit, it has kind of a sweet sour uh, lime and banana taste. Uh, you just scoop it out and eat it seeds at all, seeds and all with a spoon. It's native to Africa. It does need a very long growing season, but it's very hardy and easy to grow. I grew it on um, the south side of my shed on some strings and it just covered my 10 foot by 10 foot high uh, south facing uh, shed wall. So it is very aggressive, but I would lift, lift the kind of the greenery or foliage up and there would be the fruit hanging underneath. Um, they are, you know, I think the horned gourd or horned melon a uh, common name is, is pretty uh, appropriate because uh, those little spikes are very spiky. So if you try to grow this, harvest them with gloves. Here's another one. Um, I've been growing this for two years now. It's called a Mexican sour gherkin or sometimes also called mouse melon. Very, uh, easy to grow. It's, I've been growing it out at the 18th and Broadway Food Pantry Garden in Kansas City. And uh, it's gotten minimal care. And uh, I've gotten lots of these mouse melons, as the name might imply. And I don't know how, you know, this one, this one, the third picture on the right, um, that's probably a little bit bigger than life size. They're probably about the size of half your thumb or maybe your thumbnail and your first to the first joint on your thumb. Uh, they look like tiny watermelons or cucumbers. Um, you can eat them fresh from the garden. They're, they're kind of like a sour cucumber. Um, so kids would love them. They'd be a fun crop for kids to grow. Um, but they're, they're a great addition to just a regular salad. Um, you could also just eat them fresh like grapes. Uh, this is what they kind of look like when they're vining and then you'll just find the little uh, mouse melons in amongst the foliage. If anybody speaks Spanish, uh, the sandia de raton means watermelons of the rats or rat or mouse watermelons. And they do kind of look like um, uh, miniature 
uh, watermelons from the outside. So again, this is a crop that we, you know, we might be familiar with. I'm sure some of you have tried to grow or have been successful in growing uh, black eyed peas or Crowder peas or purple hull peas. Um, but did you know that the leaves kind of like the sweet potato leaves are edible and very nutritious too. Um, I had to, yesterday I started uh, in advance of sweet potato, sweet potato harvest. I started trimming off the vines and leaves off the beds of sweet potatoes at one of the food pantry gardens. So I brought a bouquet of leaves, uh, kind of the tips of the vines home and I had them for lunch today. So I just kind of stewed them or stir fried them down with a little olive oil, garlic, uh, soy sauce, and they were great. Um, so I encourage you before you harvest your, or as you're harvesting your sweet potatoes, uh, cut off some of those vine tips with tender leaves uh, and steam them or stir fry them and see what you think. Of course, there's all kinds of hot peppers and um, if you like hot peppers, you've probably experimented with uh, a range of different kinds. Um, again, I, I had never seen out at the training farm, many of the refugees from Burma grew kind of a, a tall pepper. I'm still trying to find out for sure what it was because what was unusual about it was is it was bushy and it had, had kind of a compact um, habit and the leaves were fuzzy. So um, I think it was some kind of Thai hot pepper, but I'm still doing research to try to figure out what it was. So as you know, Peppers like full sun, well-drained soil. Uh, they need the warm weather. Try not to disturb roots um, around the established pepper plants. And they like to be planted in rows about 18 to 24 inches apart. Um, you can also, I've been doing this with a different variety of hot pepper, uh, but I, res I rescued, many years ago, I rescued a pepper seedling that had started in the gravel of a greenhouse. And now I've been growing and saving seeds from that pepper for quite a while. Uh, I've had some plants last um, two years in a pot. Uh, you know, they're outside in the summer and bring them in for the winter. Another uh, unusual edible plant to, to look into is, um, some of the herbs. You might even have epizote in your uh, yard or garden and not even realize it. If you've got some like old pasture or disturbed fields nearby, uh, this, this one could very well be there. It's, it's one of the most important herbs uh, for uh, traditional Mexican or Guatemalan dishes. It's a kind of tall, loosely branched annual, but it has this very unusual scent, a uh, combination of cilantro or coriander, uh, licorice, pine or camphor and eucalyptus. So it, it's an unusual herb and you only want to use the new leaves and use it sparingly because it is a kind of a strong flavor or scent. And it, it self sows very freely. So if you do decide to grow some, you might want to remove it or trim it back before it goes to seed because otherwise it might become uh, kind of in invasive. The different kinds of basil, Thai basils uh, are, are very popular. Um, many cultivars of Thai basil and there were many different types grown out at the refugee farm. Um, there's also one called Tulsi or holy basil, and it has some uh, religious significance uh, in India for some religious groups, um, but it also can be used as a culinary herb, uh, and it's used widely in, in different parts of Southeast Asia. Lemongrass is another um, uh, 
kind of widely used uh, herb uh, in Asian cooking. If you've ever eaten at a Thai restaurant, you've maybe had a dish flavored with lemongrass. It has a very intense lemony, uh, kind of Swedish scent and flavor. Uh, it can be grown in a garden or containers. It likes full sun and well-drained soil. It'll tolerate some light shade, but it really does better in full sun. Um, when I originally put this presentation together, it was for our last spring gardening seminar. And so I, I was able to bring rooted stocks. I went to a local Asian grocery store and just bought a bundle. I think they sold it uh, three, three or four kind of stocks, uh, the base of the plant in a bundle. And I just rooted them in water. Um, and then I, I put them outside in a large clay pot, um, but you could put them in the ground, uh, set them outside after the last frost free date, uh, and then use the six inch sections about of the bulb, bulbous base of the plant um, for uh, adding to cooking. You would just chop it up. Um, you could also dry the majority of the plant and drop it in chop it into smaller pieces and uh, it makes a wonderful lemon flavored tea. So let's just talk quickly about some edible weeds. We all know dandelions, they're, they're give us a lot of uh, work to do in the spring in our lawns, um, but they were introduced to the United States from Europe as an edible plant in the early, with the earliest colonists in the 1600s. Um, and the roots are considered a medicinal plant and the greens are an edible green. Another so-called weed um, that gives farmers a lot of grief and, and uh, causes a lot of problems in row crops is the amaranth. Uh, but it is considered by some people to be a very, uh, nutritious grain. It has tiny, tiny round seeds that are very high in protein, vitamins, and minerals. Um, it's also known as pigweed or a superweed, uh, but the edible leaves and the young stems are high in vitamin A. Uh, I don't know how many years ago, the, one of the food, food pantry gardens, um, it was probably the 18th and Broadway Food Pantry Garden in downtown Kansas City, Missouri. And there was one bed that had started going up in weeds that hadn't been weeded yet. And a young man uh, took a shortcut through the garden and he asked me very politely um, whether he could have some of the uh, amaranth, that pigweed that had gone crazy in one of the raised beds to take home. And I said, sure. And he showed me, uh, he said he was from Mexico. He, he showed me that these fleshy uh, stems, mm. he snapped it off and then he peeled it like a banana. And there's kind of a real juicy, fleshy inner core that he ate like a stock of uh, candy. So um, it's, it's an unusual vegetable, but you might wanna try it. Um, and see what you think. Here's another one. We talked about this as a weed that you've got a hoe out of the garden, but uh, purslane, or in Spanish, it's called verdulaga, is a very nutritious uh, vegetable. Um, you can buy cultivated varieties. Um, you could uh, uh, harvest it out of your garden beds or out of the fields. Um, be sure to wash it to get all the soil off uh, and try to harvest it before it goes to seed. It's got kind of a crunchy, sticky texture. It's very high in omega-3 omega fatty acids. So it's kind of unusual for a vegetable to have that omega-3 that we usually look for fish uh, to give us. It's also very high in uh, vitamins and minerals. So 
In summary, there are many unusual vegetables and herbs from around the world that successfully grow in the hot, humid, and sometimes dry growing conditions in the Kansas City region and other parts of Missouri. As our climate changes and we possibly experience even hotter and, and more humid and challenging growing conditions, these could be crops to consider uh, to give yourself uh, nutritious, uh, wonderful vegetables to eat even in the heat of the summer. They can expand your repertoire as a gardener and a cook, increase your resiliency as a vegetable gardener, offer you more nutritious additions to your diet, and bring the flavors and culinary traditions of the world to your garden and kitchen. So again, I know these might be hard to, to write down or, or copy, but feel free, I'll have my uh, email address at the very end here. Feel free to email me if you'd like a copy of these. Um, this University of Massachusetts Center for Agriculture has an excellent website where you can get uh, detailed information on how to grow and how to use a lot of these crops that I've described. I found a, a Tennessee State Extension document all about bitter melons. So um, it might be worth looking at and maybe you uh, wanna experiment with bitter melons. I found out that there's a close relative of the bitter melon called a balsam apple that Thomas Jefferson grew in his experimental gardens at uh, Monticello. So um, it's not completely new, uh, to the United States, but it might be new to most of our uh, cuisine or, or eating habits. I found a wonderful article on the mouse melon or Mexican sour gherkin uh, from the Wisconsin Master Gardeners. Um, so that's got detailed information on how to grow it and use it. And then uh, Lutheran Services of Iowa has a program uh, to serve uh, resettled refugees. You know, many of them come to the United States. Uh, they're adjusting to their new lives and in, in, new con in a new country. A lot of them have excellent farmer farming or, you know, small producer skills. They just need to learn to adapt to uh, English and adapt to our uh, markets and ways of selling in the United States. What's great about this website is they have a whole list of recipes for a lot of these crops that I described. Um, this University of Kentucky Extension uh, site has is a good extension resource on a wide range of Asian vegetables, including Asian greens that um, I didn't really cover in this uh, presentation since I was focusing on the uh, warm season crops. This Penn State uh, Extension site also has, it's, it's geared towards uh, aiding small farmers in Africa and other countries. But again, it has detailed information on a lot of these crops that might help you decide which ones you wanna try to grow or try from a local farmer's market. And then a former um, co-worker with Extension, Lydia Kwame, uh, she was a nutrition specialist and a uh, county engagement specialist. Anyway, she was from uh, Kenya and she shared this uh, food and agriculture organization of the United Nations a recipe, a link to a whole book of recipes from Kenya and there are excellent recipes for sweet potato leaves and for cowpea leaves. Seed companies where you can buy some of these uh, seeds for these crops are Baker Creek, uh, started here in Missouri, in Southern Missouri. Uh, I think it's east of Springfield is where their original store and operation was. They have all kinds of seeds from all over the world. When I, I worked for four years at the uh, 
refugee training farm and um, one of the companies where I found a lot of the seeds for crops that they were wanting to grow uh, was the Seeds of India. This Kitazawa Seed Company um, is one of the oldest Asian vegetable seed companies in the United States. They've got a wide range of seeds. And then our local in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Kansas City Community Gardens has uh, several of seeds for several of these crops. That's where I got the mouse melon seeds. Uh, seed Savers Exchange would be another place to look. And this Southern Exposure Seed Exchange um, uh, would be another place to look, especially if you want to dive into the world of cow peas. Um, so they have a great selection. And then I really encourage you, um, you know, I've talked about this new roots for refugees here in the Kansas City region. I encourage you to try to, you know, make contact with some of these local experts, these uh, local uh, resettled refugees that are farming. Um, the, the farmers here in uh, the Kansas City area are uh, many ethnic groups from Burma and uh, many different African nations. Um, and they sell uh, not only over on the Kansas side, but they sell their produce uh, at several uh, farmers markets on, in the Kansas City, Missouri, part of the metro region. And I'm sure that um, you can find farmers markets in other parts of the state where immigrant farmers are selling uh, vegetables uh, from their traditions, their uh, agriculture, agricultural and culinary traditions. And I just want to let you know that they sell more than, than these unusual vegetables. They also sell familiar vegetables because they're entrepreneurs and they're trying to supplement their income at least uh, by marketing vegetables. It's a great way, I think, to use their skills from their countries of origin, origin but uh, helps them establish their new life in the United States. And I tried to find um, the International Institute in St. Louis uh, had a farming program. I think I've talked to the director and they're in the, it's in the process of transitioning to a, another uh, nonprofit. So you might keep your eyes and ears open to find out, um, you know, what, what plans they have for the future. I was also told that uh, many of the immigrant farmers in the St. Louis, city of St. Louis, uh, have community gardens in the Tower Grove area, kind of South St. Louis region. Um, I don't know if any of them are actually have big enough gardens to be able to sell uh, at local farmers markets. But I did also in the middle of the state in Columbia, I think, I, I don't know if there's an organization, one particular organization or agency that aids immigrant farmers, but I did look at the listings for at least one farmer's market in Columbia, and there were multiple vendors selling uh, unusual vegetables from Asia and different parts of the world. So again, this New Roots for Refugee, that's kind of our local uh, program here in the Kansas City area that aids immigrant farmers. I really encourage you, no matter what part of the state uh, you're in, to look at their website. Um, not only is there information on their farming program, but lots of great recipes. So thanks for your time and consideration. And Dave, I hope we have time for some questions. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> there were two specific questions that perhaps you would address. Uh, I'm paraphrasing the question. Are any of these plants that you mentioned considered to be deer resistant? Good question. Um, I think several <clears throat> of the vining crops like the mouse melon or bitter melon, um, possibly <clears throat> even the Italian edible gourd has kind of bristly or, or um, fuzzy leaves that I think discourages deer. But of course, of course, I've always heard that when deer get hungry enough, they'll eat anything. I've heard um, the same. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's about 
the only information on on uh, deer resistant vegetables in this uh, collection here that I could offer. Okay, the other question dealt with if seeds are brought in from outside of the United States, is there the danger of introducing an invasive plant? Yeah, good United question. Um, here's if there's seeds that are purchased by a, a seed company, they've gone through all kinds of analysis and inspection whether they were grown and, and imported to the United States or grown here, uh, you know, in the United States, they've, they've gone through testing and analysis um, and to make sure that they're uh, disease-free and, and weed seed-free. Now, I won't say that I won't, didn't hear of, of people you know, sending relatives that are still in their countries of origin, sending them, you know, wrapped in tissue paper in a letter, seeds uh, unofficially um, entering the United States. Uh, so that, that does happen. Um, but hopefully even those seeds may be originated from a vendor uh, overseas that did some some level of inspection uh, and safety checking. Well, we can only hope so. I know there was yes. uh, last year seeds arriving unannounced, uh, yes. originating from China. And uh, I guess they're still trying to figure out why someone would send seeds that hadn't been requested, but whatever the case, yeah, the U.S. Department of Agriculture recommended that uh, they be destroyed or turned into a local agency, right? Uh, so for as far as the sake of uh, safety and security. Yes, I I would uh, agree with that. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me, um, Bill and <coughs> at Missouri. Dot edu 